Hey guys, it's Kiana with the Emerald Coast Science Center and we're back today on my back porch and we're going to continue our series talking about marine animals. So if you watched our last video, we talked about some sharks and some rays and some skates. Um, but today we're going to continue on and we're going to move out of that uh, class chondrichthys and we're going to move into reptiles. So reptilia is the class that we're going to be in today and we're going to be talking about marine reptiles. And so in order to be considered a marine reptile, it's basically dependent on how how much you rely on the ocean so you have to spend a good amount of time in the ocean rely on it for your food or your habitat various things like that but because we are in the reptile group and these guys have secondarily adapted to go back into the ocean it's a little different than some of the other ocean animals that we've talked about so we know sharks they started in the ocean and their ancestry is or originated in the ocean as well but when we talk about the reptiles the way that we believe their uh, evolution went is that they started in the water, they evolved to life on land, and then they secondarily evolved back into the ocean. And that explains a lot of the reasons that these guys still rely a lot on land for at least part of their life cycle, or if nothing else, they still breathe air instead of have those gills to survive purely in the water alone. So that is what kind of gives us the biggest indication that these guys once ancestrally lived on land. Um, so. When we talk about our marine reptiles, some of the basic ones that we uh, think about are things like sea turtles, we also have sea snakes, um, and we have marine iguanas. Um, some people consider some uh, saltwater crocodiles to be marine as well, but they're technically not truly marine uh, reptiles, um, but we'll kind of get into them a little bit as well. So today I think I'd like to start with talking about our marine uh, snakes first. So our sea snakes, there is the highest abundance of species of sea snakes as compared to other marine reptiles. So there's gonna be more species of sea snakes than there are of like sea turtles and stuff like that. So there's about 50 to 60 different species of marine snakes. Um, and these guys are gonna be really similar to terrestrial snakes that we would find here on land, except that they have had a couple little adaptions to help them live in the water. Uh, one of the things that we see is different between these guys is that they have different scales on their stomach. So if you are familiar with any of the snakes we have at our center, they've got scales scales on their back that are different from the scales on their belly. On their belly, they're gonna have wider scales that are kind of uh, more suited to help them move as they're trying to crawl or slither over the land. Whereas marine snakes, they don't really spend a lot of time doing that. They're gonna be a little higher up in the water column usually, so they don't really have to like use those scales to help them uh, move on the floor of the ocean. So instead, they have um, scales that kind of are similar to their scales on their back throughout their entire body. Something else that's kind of cool about these guys is their scales um, allow them to do a little bit of uh, respiration. So there's a little bit of air exchange that they're capable, to, capable of doing through their skin, um, which is pretty unique to most reptiles because most reptiles have pretty uh, thick scaly skin and so that doesn't allow for a lot of air exchange. But sea snakes have been seen to do about 25% of their uh, oxygen intake and uh, transferred through their skin alone. So that's really beneficial since they do still breathe air even though they are a marine reptile. So like I said, these guys do breathe air, so they do have to surface uh, fairly regularly to get those breaths, but they are capable of doing really deep dives um, because they have really high lung capacity. So their lungs kind of stretch the entire length of their body almost. And so that kind of helps them to take those big deep breaths um, and have them hold that breath longer because they're underwater. But these guys um, also have specialized tails that help them live in the water as well. So if you've seen any of our snakes at our center, their tails are kind of pointed at the end and they kind of just elongate out. Um, but sea snakes actually have more of a paddle-like shape to their tails, and so that kind of helps them swim. Um, but other than that, they look pretty much identical to a land snake, and um, they're going to move kind of like you would imagine a snake to move, so a slithering motion, but through the water. Um, these snakes are venomous, so a lot of people... Um, ask that about our snakes at our center and so none of the snakes at our center uh, are venomous but sea snakes definitely are but fortunately these sea snakes are not very aggressive and so being bit by a sea snake is not very common even though that venom that they do have is uh, lethal they typically don't expel a lethal amount of venom per bite so even when they do bite people it's usually not um, enough venom to kill them even though they are definitely capable of doing so 
So sea snakes can be pretty cool out to see out in the wild, but we unfortunately do not have any around here, maybe fortunately, but um, these guys are usually found in places like the Indian and the Pacific. Um, there's a couple of seen in the Atlantic, but usually not in the Gulf, so it's not really common for us to come across them around our areas. Um, another example of a marine reptile are our marine iguanas. So those guys are really cool. There's only a couple of species of them and they're only really found in the Galapagos Islands. Um, so you wouldn't see them around here either, but these guys uh, are gonna spend most of their time living on land, but their diet is going to be um, the marine algae that grows in rocks under the water. So because they spend so much time in the water and their diet is, uh, is reliant on the ocean environment, these guys are considered marine. So these guys are going to be diving uh, off the rocks where they spend most of their time sunbathing and they'll be swimming through the water to get that algae off the rocks and they kind of scrape it off with their mouths and that's what they're going to be eating. But these guys, uh, like I was talking about in one of our other videos, they have to uh, adapt to having a really high salt content. And so one of the things that these guys do to kind of uh, alleviate that excess salt that they're going to have in their bodies from spending so much time in the salt water and eating uh, food that has a high salt content is these guys are actually able to um, expel salt through their noses. So they can actually sneeze out salt that has been um, filtered out of their bodies through glands in their noses. But like I said, these marine iguanas are usually found in the Galapagos area and they are usually found in colonies. So they can live with uh, groups of other iguanas. There can be dozens or even uh, hundreds of iguanas all living in the same area and kind of foraging together. Uh, they can be territorial, especially the males when it comes to mating season, but uh, they do still live in big groups. Uh, these guys, like I said, they do dive down for their food, and so these guys are capable of actually diving to depths of almost 100 feet, and they can hold their breath for up to an hour. Uh, most dives are going to be a lot shallower and a lot shorter than that, but they have been seen to dive very deep and very long. But yeah, so marine iguanas are pretty cool. Um, but the ones that I'm most interested in, because these guys are my favorite animals, are our sea turtles. So there are seven species of sea turtles, and all of them except one nest right here on our beaches. So beaches uh, right along our Gulf Coast. The only one that doesn't is the Australian flatback. Their scientific name is Nitato depressus. And those guys are only found in Australia. So that's the only reason that they're not found here is because these guys are only found on the northern coast of Australia. But our other species that we have here, we have our hawksbill, we have our Kemp's Ridley, we have our Olive Ridley, we have our um, loggerhead, our green sea turtle, and our leatherback sea turtle. So those are going to be the ones that we're going to have nesting on our beaches. So it's especially important for us to make sure that we are aware of these animals because um, we can affect them most directly because they're found right here, right? So one of the things that we can do to help these guys out is making sure that when we are uh, using their beaches, we are cleaning up after ourselves and so making sure we get rid of any trash and anything like that that might be left behind. Um, and also making sure that when we are playing in the sand that we fill in any holes that we dig or knock down any sand castles because these sea turtles are going to be using those beaches for their nesting, right? So sea turtles spend most of their time in the ocean and they only really come on land to lay their eggs. So females, um, they do something called philopatry, which means that these guys are going to re uh, return to the same beaches where they were hatched on. So that's something really cool about these guys that even though they uh, leave for so long, they're able to find exactly where they were uh, born. So these guys are going to uh, lay their eggs on the same beaches that they were born on. So when a sea turtle lays their eggs, they uh, usually lay several clutches of eggs per um, season. So they'll have a couple different nests and each nest can contain anywhere from 50 to 350 eggs. Um, and depending on the species and depending on the individual is gonna kind of determine that. But uh, yeah, so the sea turtles will come onto the beach, lay their eggs. Usually they do this at night because it's when it's the most safe. There is some species of Ridley turtles though that are going to do it during the day and sometimes they'll do it in large groups. So most sea turtles do it at night all by themselves, but some do it during the day with um, dozens of other sea turtles all at once, which is a really cool thing to see, but we don't usually see them do that too much on our beaches. I'm an example here of what some of those eggs look like. So they're pretty uh, round eggs with a leathery shell. And so they're not hard like chicken eggs or leathery like most reptile eggs are gonna be. Um, but they kind of look like little ping pong balls and the different sea turtles are gonna have different sized eggs. So our largest sea turtles are these leatherbacks down here. And um, they're one of the easiest ones to identify because their carapace or their shell has a much different appearance than some of our other turtles. So most turtles are going to have little scoots and little um, distinct plates 
looking looking structures on their shell all in a pattern um or these guys kind of look like their shell is one big structure with those um long lines of uh long line patterns on them but those are our largest sea turtles so our leatherbacks they do nest here but they're one of the more rare ones to see in our area um but these guys can get to be larger than human beings so they can be six to nine feet long so they're really really big um, some of our other turtles can be smaller than that, like two feet um, for some of our Ridleys and our smaller turtles, but um, some of the ones that we see around here a lot are our loggerheads and our green sea turtles. Those are some of our most common ones. Those guys can get about three to four feet, so they're still pretty big as well, but not quite as big as our leatherbacks. But yeah, so like I said, these guys nest on our beaches, so it's really important for us to make sure that we're keeping those beaches clean. Um, something that became pretty trendy recently was um, trying to reduce our uses of one-use plastics, such as straws. So give up straws to help sea turtles, and that is really beneficial to reduce the amount of plastic that ends up in our oceans. But one of the things that these sea turtles come into contact with, especially on our beaches, is actually fishing line and fishing hooks. So if you really want to help out some sea turtles, some things that you can do is to make sure that if you are on the beach and you can keep an eye out for those things and help clean them up if you see them. Also, if you are a fisherman, making sure that you are uh, re, um, disposing of these things in a responsible way. So making sure you don't just cut your line and let it go. You are disposing of it in the proper trash cans and stuff like that. Um, and also another thing if you were really uh, interested in is you can reduce the amount of dependence that you have on seafood. So cutting some seafood out of your diet or making sure that the seafood that you are eating is coming from safe, sustainable sources is another great way to help these guys out um, because overfishing um, and getting trapped in entanglements of fishing nets and fishing lines is really common for these guys. Um, something that we've been doing to kind of help this is that we've uh, invented something called a TED or a turtle exclusion device. And these are basically little gates that we put on nets to allow sea turtles to escape. So we know sea turtles are uh, reptiles that still have to breathe air. So even though they can hold their breath for several hours, especially when they're pretty inactive, um, they still need to breathe. So if they get caught in a net, they're going to be held underwater for a long time and they won't be able to surface and then they end up dying that way. So even if the fisherman pulls up his net, sees there's a sea turtle in there and throws it back, a lot of times that is uh, too late for these guys. So being part of bycatch is a big problem for them. And so bycatch basically is just when you go out fishing, you're usually fishing for one type of fish and anything else that you catch in your net that you weren't trying to get is called bycatch. And unfortunately, most things caught as bycatch still die anyway, which, um, you know, is really unfortunate because, you know, they kind of died for no reason. We didn't even want them in the first place. But like I said, we've invented TEDs to help um, sea turtles to escape from nests um, if they get to, uh, caught in them so that way they don't end up dying. We have a picture here of kind of what a TED looks like. So basically there's a long net here and so the fish would come in and then they would fall through the grates of this net right here or this is like kind of bars and so they would go right through and continue into the net but sea turtles are going to hit these bars and be able to swim out of the hatch on the side. So it's possible that they might lose some fish that way too, but for the most part, the fish are going to go right through and any bigger objects or uh, animals are going to be able to escape out of the side. So that's something that we've done to kind of help um, fish in responsible way. So that's great improvements. So like I said, we have seven species of sea turtles. And one of the activities that we have at the center is this cool little dichotomous key. And if you remember my um, video on taxonomy, I kind of mentioned some dichotomous key activities. Um, but this is one of the ones that we have at the center. We can kind of use this to help identify our sea turtles, right? So we have little examples here of what some of the sea turtles look like. And based on different characteristics of their body, we can kind of um, go through our list and determine what's what. So right here, these aren't really size scale, but you can kind of see this is our supposed to be our leatherback sea turtle. So you can see its shell looks much different than this guy's shell, right? And so that's kind of what I was talking about earlier. This is a fun little activity to play with if you come into our center to kind of uh, improve your sea turtle identification abilities. But yeah, so like I said, uh, these guys do nest on our beaches and so another thing that um, we can do to help these guys is reduce our amount of light pollution. So what that is is basically, um, you know, in nature there's not a lot of artificial lights. But when humans move into an area we bring in all of our street lights and our house lights and our car lights and stuff like that. And so that ends up polluting the area 
with light. And so one of the things that these guys rely on is the ability to see the moon once they hatch. And so once a sea turtle hatches, it's going to look for the moon and look for the reflection of the moon on the water. And that's gonna kind of be the way that it's able to decide how to get to the ocean. And so a lot of times what happens when these nests are laid um, on a beach that has like a hotel nearby or a bunch of houses nearby, those houses or those hotels will have lights on and the sea turtles will see them and go towards those buildings instead of towards the ocean, which obviously is not where they want to be and they'll end up in the streets or they'll end up dying in the sand um, and not ever making it to the ocean. So like I said, lots of babies are born uh, are, are laid or hatched at one time. And so the reason for that is because they are so susceptible to so many things like, you know, never finding the ocean and the longer it takes them to find the ocean, the more predators they're um, likely to come in contact with. So a lot of things wait for sea turtles to hatch. Um, there's reptiles that eat them. There's uh, birds mostly, and there's also crabs that can eat them and things like um, foxes and stuff like that in our area, coyotes. They'll um, go after sea turtle uh, hatchlings as well because they are small and they can make a pretty easy food for, source for these guys. Because if you can imagine 50 of them all at once, even if you only get a couple, that's still a lot, right? Um, but yeah, so making sure that these guys are able to find their way to the ocean is really important. So making sure that we are reducing the amount of light uh, pollution that we are emitting. And also, uh, and that can be done by turning off lights, but also we can replace outside lights with what are called red lights. And they're exactly what they sound like they are. They're just light bulbs that are red. And this actually doesn't produce the same uh, wavelengths uh, as, uh, you know, our white lights do. And so these don't interrupt those sea turtles um, ability to find the moonlight because it doesn't really look the same and so they don't really see it as well and so it kind of just looks like dark to them but we can kind of still see because we can see those lights a little better than they can so replacing our outer lights with those red lights is really beneficial as well so when a sea turtle is born they're going to go right to the ocean and they're actually going to spend the first couple years of their life in a pelagic phase of their lives so they're going to spend most of their lives in the deep water swimming around out there and sometimes they'll kind of hang out around um, seaweed flats are sargassum weed uh, floats that are hanging out in the water and they'll kind of stay around those and they'll hide in the shade and they'll eat around them and stuff and they're going to spend most of that first couple of years of their life in the deep ocean part of um in this deep ocean phase and they're not really going to come closer to shore until they're a little bit older so once they do reach a couple years old they're going to kind of get closer to the shore and that's when we're going to kind of see them more often which is usually why you don't see teeny tiny turtles swimming in the ocean you'll kind of see the bigger ones um, if you go out snorkeling or something so as sea turtles grow they're um, going to kind of change what they eat sometimes so things like our uh, green sea turtles when they're younger they're going to have mostly a, a an omnivore diet so they're going to eat plants and animals um, and then once they're older they're going to kind of turn into more vegetarians uh, or herbivores and so they're going to rely more on vegetation for their food and so one of the really important roles that a lot of our green sea turtles do is that these guys actually eat um, seagrass and not a lot of animals do that so they're in charge of keeping our seagrass beds under control and these seagrass beds are really important because these are really big nursery habitats for a lot of animals so a lot of animals will have their little babies there and as those animals are growing and getting bigger they have that shelter of those seagrass beds to kind of protect them so that when they're able to um so that they're able to grow bigger and kind of move on to other habitats. So things like baby fish and baby crabs and uh, all kinds of things like that are all gonna be found in those seagrass beds. So it's really important that those sea turtles are able to, um, you know, kind of maintain that habitat for them. But there are other sea turtles who uh, are gonna be omnivorous their whole life. Sea turtles can eat things like fish and crabs. They also eat sponges and seagrass, like I was mentioning. Um, so we've got some sea turtles that rely mostly exclusively on eating things like sea sponges. And then we have our leatherback sea turtles, those really big ones, who um, feed almost exclusively on jellyfish. But yeah, so a bunch of different turtles have a bunch of different feeding styles, um, depending on their species and also depending where they're from. So you're gonna eat kind of what is around you, right? So the last reptile that I kind of mentioned were our crocodiles. So saltwater crocodiles, like I said, they're not truly considered marine uh, reptiles, but they do have a high salt um, tolerance and they're able to, um, they do possess a lot of those adaptations to help them live in that salt water. So that's kind of um, why they sometimes get lumped into this group as well. 
So we know that uh, crocodiles are able to live in the water and on land, but they do breathe air, so they do still have to surface um, to breathe even when they are in the water. The saltwater crocodiles are considered the largest reptile. These guys can be over a ton uh, weight-wise, so 2,000 to 3,000 pounds at their max, and they can also grow to be about 20 feet long, so they are absolutely massive. Um, we don't have saltwater crocodiles around here, uh, but we do have American alligators, which obviously aren't marine reptiles because they don't usually live in the ocean or the saltwater. They're more freshwater animals, um, but those are the ones that we're usually more familiar with right here in Florida because we do have those American crocodiles living right here in our backyards. Um, so those guys, they're going to be about half the size of a saltwater crocodile. So they can be around 11 to 13 feet long and they can weigh up to a thousand pounds. So they are still really big, but not quite as big as those saltwater crocodiles. Um, something cool about these guys is that the sex of their babies or the gender of their babies is determinant on the uh, temperature of the nest that they were um, laid in, which is the same for our sea turtles as well. So for our sea turtles, um, the hotter the nest is, the more females you'll end up having in um, when they hatch. And then if it's colder, it'll be mostly males. And so their gender is determined by the temperature that they were incubating in. It's pretty cool. But yeah, like I said, um, our saltwater crocodiles aren't found around here, but our American alligators are. And one of the easiest way to kind of tell the difference between a crocodile and an alligator is usually by looking at their face shape. So the shape of their snout is going to be one of the easiest ones to look for. Um, alligators are the ones with the more rounded snouts and they don't have as many exposed teeth sticking out all jagged. They kind of fit a little better into their top or bottom jaw. Whereas crocodiles are going to have a more narrow pointed snout and they are going to have those jagged teeth all over the place. So there's a couple other things to use uh, to kind of determine determine the difference, but usually when you um, see them from a distance, that's one of the easiest things to kind of look at and point out if it's a crocodile or an alligator. All right, guys, so that's about all I have on reptiles for today. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Reptiles are one of my favorite topics, and we have a lot of really cool reptiles at our center for you guys to check out. So if you do want to see some terrestrial examples, we definitely have some, and we can always use those guys as a good way to kind of compare and contrast between um, our terrestrial and our marine reptiles. So if you ever want to check them out, please do. Yeah, I hope everybody's staying healthy out there and staying happy, and we can't wait to open and see you guys soon. We're working on a lot of really exciting projects at our center, um, some of them even involving sea turtles. So hopefully you guys will get to check out some of those new improvements when we open up soon. But um, have a great day guys!